the discussant of uh, t the two papers uh, this morning will be uh, Dr. Leston Havens, who is professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a supervisor and seminar leader at the Cambridge Hospital. Dr. Havens has spent his career looking at uh, the various schools of psychiatry to, to, and tried to explain uh, to the clinical world how to put uh, a theoretical uh, thought into practice. In particular, he's talked about the interview process and the suicidal patient and how the therapist must use himself as a barometer. Uh, I myself have had uh, many occasions to talk over the patients I've talked about and other patients with Dr. Havens, and for that I feel privileged. It's my pleasure to welcome him this morning. Well, I don't know what I should say. It's, it's um, a really kind of terrifying experience to come up here after this morning. It's a lighthearted morning. The, um, uh, it, uh, I, thought it, I thought of something awfully silly to say, which, made, which gave me a little bit of a lift, so I thought it might help you too. The, um, you remember Doug's comical incident about sending the police only to find that the patient had talked the police out of their mission. Do you remember the old James Thurber story about the unicorn in the garden? Well, anyway, the, I think it's the gentleman in the house goes into the garden and comes back and tells his wife there's a unicorn in the garden. And she says that there isn't, the unicorn is a mythical beast. And uh, he goes back two or three times, each time reporting this unicorn. And eventually, she, like Doug, calls the police. And the, the uh, little men in the white coat, or whatever they're called nowadays, and uh, they come, and in the course of the discussion, the wife is, instead of the husband, the wife is taken away to the hospital for, for insisting that anybody could say this to, uh, any sane person could say this. And the, I mention it because the, the moral of the story, like the moral at the end of the story that Thurber gave us was, don't count your boobies until they're hatched. <laughs> well, perhaps it, perhaps it won't help. <laughs> the, uh, I um, uh, wanted to mention some connecting links in the, in the morning's speeches, and then I would uh, wanted to add some suggestions of my own uh, to the care of the patient. And I'll make this very brief, because lunch is, is almost upon us. The, um, the first part of the morning was devoted to a very large uh, review of the suicide problem in a contextual social basis. And I thought it was very interesting that it, it ended with a, a reminder of one facet of suicidal treatment that uh, is often neglected. And one way of saying what Dr. Zinberg was telling us was that the, um, the patient's constant attitude, to use a, an old phrase for it, the patient's constant attitude in the case of his second patient, the low profile attitude, needed a great deal of attention. And for the reason that was implicit in what Dr. Zinberg was telling us is that very often we act in such a way as to reinforce the patient's constant attitude, that we fall victim to the demands the patient makes in the clinical situation to see them as worthless. And uh, the kind of vigilance that's required in order not to reinforce a self-destructive personal attitude is very great and was implicit, I think, in many of the many of the aspects of his clinical vignette, vignettes. Um, you remember that this idea came perhaps most forcibly into psychoanalysis from Wilhelm Reich in his discussion of character pathology. And uh, his was, of course, a very active assault on the patient's characterological convictions. That isn't, I don't think, the kind of thing that Dr. Zinberg is recommending. What he is recommending, I think, is an attention to the patient's covert attitude toward themselves and, and an utmost vigilance in keeping from falling into a reinforcement of those attitudes. And uh, it would be fun to discuss the, his case or other cases and to, to, to look for the subtle ways in which 
we are made co-conspirators in maintaining an attitude of, uh, of uh, depreciation for the patient. The, um, Dr. Maltzberger's presentation presented us now with a, with a set of dangerous fantasies, uh, dangerous drives for death, uh, dangerous perceptions of the world, and uh, he recommended at times interpreting these things to patients. But you notice at the end of his remarks, he was, he was very uh, uh, eloquent in telling us how much the person of the therapist had to substitute for and ameliorate in some ways these destructive drives. Now, the, the point about that I want to emphasize uh, is that, that when clinical hate and clinical love, which will, I think, bring us to Dr. Jacobs' paper, uh, that when clinical hate is dominant in a situation, whether hate directed at the patient from a hallucinated or separated part of themselves, or hate towards someone else, talking about the hate, interpreting the hate, is, is very seldom, in my experience, useful. Indeed, it may aggravate the hate. Um, however, the stance of empathy with hate often has dramatic effects in reducing the amount of clinical uh, murderousness that's present in the situation and in the patient's experience. Now, the difficulty of empathy with hate, in my experience of myself and of supervising others, the difficulty of reaching a point where one can empathize with hate is that it is very difficult for us often clinically to accept that empathy with hate means that we express the hate for the patient. The empathy with sadness, empathy with anxiety, most of us can manage. We can share the sadness of a depressed person, for example. But sharing rage, which also means expressing the patient's rage, is something which I have noticed most people draw back forcibly from. Of course, they fear that if they express the rage, for example, toward a malignant or invasive person or object in the patient's uh, mental life, they fear that if they express that, they may appear to be reinforcing that fate of hate, reinforcing that hate. In fact, the expression of rage for a patient generally, I mean, I know always or never, but in my experience, generally diminishes the patient's hate, both because the patient knows it is understood and also because it is expressed for the patient. It is shared. And remember what the word share means is to apportion or divide. And so that when we express, and I mean express, a patient's hatred, we as a rule reduce its impingement on the clinical situation. For example, where there is a, uh, a hallucinatory object that is seen as dangerous, the, pa the therapist's capacity to express the patient's feeling for that hated object, hatred toward the hated object, reduces that hate, perhaps both because it's expressed directly for them and also because that hatred that they're experiencing from outside is in part their own projected hatred, so that when it's expressed directly by them, they find that they're less uh, plagued by it from externally. Now, this is a, uh, as I say, is a, is a a thing that most of us hesitate to do because of the both undignified, unprofessional, and disturbing aspect of really sharing a person's murderousness. The same thing is true in my experience of sharing love. You remember Dr. Maltzberger told us that one of the possible mechanisms of suicide was the, s the search for the beloved. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the case, that the second case that Doug Jacobs presented to us of the patient's love is, in this case, directed toward Dr. Jacobs, and that her deep love for him and her deep fear about what that love involves is a very difficult thing to surface effectively in the clinical situation. And it's my experience that the thing that makes empathy with love, that is the open expression of love by the therapist, not the therapist's love for the patient, but the the patient's love for the therapist, mind you, or the patient's love for someone else. What makes it so difficult, my experience, for therapists to empathize with love is that it seems immodest. 
it seems immodest. For example, if the therapist is going to empathize with Dr. Jacobs' love, patient's love for him, he's going to have to say something like, you must love me so much. Now, salesmen and politicians have no difficulty saying that. <laughs> Indeed, sometimes it seems to be the only thing they can say. We, however, we mental health workers are a more modest lot. We keep, to use uh, Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Zinberg's phrase, we keep a lower profile. And therefore, for us to be able to say, you must love me so much, and no wonder you can't stand leaving my presence. So to be able, in other words, to surface the full intensity of the patient's desire for the therapist, and therefore bring it out in the open, express it, and by that means diminish it. To do that is for us, in my experience, a very difficult thing indeed. Finally, I want to suggest still another intervention that, that I have found very useful. When we are dealing with hostile interjects, and Lord knows not much time passes without our dealing with hostile interjects in one way or another, we often do what we have been taught to do, which is to, for the most part, try to reduce or remove the interject by mourning the ambivalently uh, related to object. However, many times the mourning treatment of hostile inner objects is not successful. And that, I think, is often due to the fact that the patient has been so overrun by hostile figures, perhaps real, certainly uh, internal figures, has been so for so long overrun by hostile figures that there's almost no one left of them, so to speak, who can do the mourning job. The patients have so little sense of themselves that the idea of being without these hostile objects or themselves having the courage to say goodbye to them or stand up to them, that kind of courage is, is, it seems to them, a very remote possibility. So I have found that I, I have to use what I, what I call performatives, that is, a speech form which locates something in the patient that I can support, and it's usually something that is under attack by the interjects. For example, I think of a patient who, whose gentleness and generosity were extraordinarily demeaned, both in his family and by his own machismo ideal. But yet this generosity on his part, this secret part of himself, was, it turned out, a very central part of the, of the self that would evolve for this man. But what I had to do, I thought, was to find a way to reach into him and, so to speak, pat that on the head or hold it by the hand, somehow defend it by my approval uh, against the constant criticism of these hostile interjects. Now, admiration and approval of patients are not things that, for the most part, we are taught to do. Indeed, it seems like a dangerous disruption of our supposed neutrality or anonymity. Nor am I supposing that it's useful generally to admire people on a diffuse basis, so, although sometimes, of course, it is. But searching for remnants of a person that you might bring to flower will often be fostered by you being able to say something to the patient which locates that quality in the, in the, uh, in the area of your approval. I call these things performatives because I, I read a little book by an English philosopher once called How to Do Things with Words, which is a, which is a appropriate title for a, a psychotherapist's book, but it's a philosophical book, but it describes what performative statements are. And performative statements are statements that perform just by being made, as opposed to imperatives, where something is carried out because I order it to be done. But a performative statement is one which does its work by being uttered. And the examples are, I pronounce you man and wife, or I christen you uh, the Queen Elizabeth II, or I knight you Sir Lancelot. These rather priestly legal functions bring into being various important states of both of mind and of social position, don't they? 
we ourselves as, as therapists also have an area of performative function. We are expected to know by our patient what is healthy about them. The fact that we very often don't know what is healthy about them doesn't mean that we're not expected to know. Like a surgeon, we're expected to be able to tell the difference between cancerous and normal tissue. And so when I say to my patient, how wonderful to be generous, I'm essentially locating an abused normal tissue, so I see it, in this person. And that admiration for something in an individual under attack is often decisive in keeping off, in holding away the hostile people that would like to destroy this patient, either in reality or in fantasy. I, I make those suggestions both to, to re reinforce Dr. Zinberg's suggestion about the character pathology and the way we approach it, then to, to speak about empathy with rage and love, and finally to, to, to urge the consideration of admiration for beleaguered people, often as a life-saving measure. Thank you very much.